Deborah Mann. I'm one of the co-chairs of science activities along with Judy Webster. Judy, would you? Um, we are, last month, we had the wonderful opportunity to do a, an astronomy future cast from Hawaii because of Nancy Mueller. And tonight, we are going to go from um, Boyd Canyon to Namibia, from lizard to lizard, because of Leslie Van Houten. So Leslie, would you get started? I will, thank you all everybody. And I want to add my welcome. So first of all, I want to know, is the chancellor on yet? Kim Wilcox? <laughs> are on you yet. Fabulous. There he is. There he is. Hi, Kim. Hi, <laughs> welcome. So all, I want all the faces to... get really small. <laughs> I wanted to add my welcome to, as uh, we explore the world of science through arts. Um, our first program, as Deborah said, enveloped us in the marvels of the ever expanding universe. But today we're going to go down to the tiniest grains of sand and learn about the animals that. Uh, and the, uh, that inhabit that wonderful desert land. We're going to first start with a whirlwind tour, tour of the University of California's natural reserve system. <laughs> and then we're going to journey to Boyd Deep Canyon in the Coachella Valley for an in-depth experience. Boyd Reserve is managed and operated by the University of California Riverside. So you know how thrilled I went, was when Kim Wilcox, the chancellor of the University of California, Riverside, agreed to give introductory remarks. But before I turn it over to him, I wanna tell you a little bit about Chancellor Wilcox. In 2013, and under his leadership, UCR has grown considerably, not only in terms of faculty and research, but in its national reputation for successful student outcomes. Over the past four years, the faculty has grown by almost 200 including the addition I learned of two Nobel laureates in science. And at the same time, the racial, ethnic, and gender diversity of the faculty has increased. It was a wonderful movement and it has worked. Additionally, two important schools have been added. The School of Medicine, which is really important. It is serving the Inland Empire. Medical students are really committed to serving their, that area. And dreadfully medically underserved area. And they also added the School of Public Policy. So I wanna tell you also a little bit about the rankings and the student outcomes. And these are just a few. Money Magazine ranks the universities which are the best bang for your bucks and UCR is number 12. Um, it is also ranked about the top 1% of universities worldwide according to the 2019-20 Center for World University rankings. And for the last two years, US News and World Report ranked UCR as the top university for social mobility of its students. On a personal note, I wanna tell you um, how body at UCR, they are incredibly diverse and they look like the state of California. And what really touches my heartstrings is most of them or many of them are first generation college students. And I, mm -hmm. and I had something said my internet connection is unstable, which makes me unstable. But, <laughs> <laughs> and as if that were not enough, Chancellor Wilcox is himself a master of science degree uh -oh. and a PhD in speech and hearing science from Purdue University. And I have it on very good authority that he has a surprisingly good singing voice. So I'm going to turn it over to Chancellor Wilcox to sing the praises of Boyd. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> uh, great, great to be here uh, and, and spend a few, few moments with you. Uh, the, the, I've got the enviable task of talking about some delightful things. Um, Many, many people don't realize, people know about the University of California and its breadth and its success. And of course, you can see over my shoulder, some of our accolades here in, in Riverside. We're very proud of being the number one university in America in terms of lifting students up from one place in society to another. 
but where, where we may be number one, the rest of the top 10 is peppered with other UC campuses. It's part of what makes the UC a special place. Uh, but there are other, lots of other things that make the UC a special place. One of the pieces that too many people unfortunately don't appreciate is the natural reserve system. The university operates 40 natural reserves. We work to keep them natural. And there are places both for maintenance of the environment, but also for studying the environment. And uh, they're split up. So we have responsibility here in Riverside for some, and, and each of the campuses have some uh, of their own to, to, to manage. And they collectively represent pretty much all the major uh, ecosystems of the state, from the coasts to the mountains to the deserts. Um, and each of them has ongoing research uh, activities. Most of them have places for investigators to come and stay and actually learn and study. And today we're fortunate to have um, two of my friends, Violet and Al, uh, from Boyd Deep Canyon. And I want to tell you a little bit about Boyd Deep Canyon. Um, it's just south of Palm Springs. I'll let them tell you more. But I've been out there, Diane and I have been out there two or three, four times, I guess now, to go hiking. And um, I recommend a chance, if you ever get to Boyd, to, to, to take a look. Uh, we went out with some friends one day, hiked deep into the canyon, and uh, all the way to the little water hole. Uh, it was described as a spring, but it's just really a small <laughs> hole, let's be honest, right, Father? <laughs> and we sat down to have lunch. And one of the things that um, everyone wants to see when they go to Boyd Canyon are the bighorn sheep. We'd been there several times, hadn't seen bighorn sheep. So we sat down around this little hole, uh, three of us on one side, one on the other, and we were munching away when the person on the other side said, there's the sheep. And sure <laughs> enough, up the mountain were dozens. I mean, there were dozens of sheep up there. And during our lunch, they kept coming down closer and closer and closer because we apparently were there during the time to get a drink from the, from the water hole. Uh, and it was just a delightful uh, reminder of here we are, a stone's throw from the city of Palm Springs in the middle of a natural area, but also in the middle of a research area. Um, some people have described these natural reserves as crown jewels the crown jewels of the university. There are 41 crown jewels. And I think that captures a good sense of it in that crown jewels are precious. Uh, we, 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 we take care of them, we nurture them. They're long lasting, they're long standing. The crown jewels have been in the Tower of London in Britain for hundreds of years. Uh, but there's a fundamental difference between these natural reserves and, and typical crown jewels. Uh, in Britain, the crown jewels are locked away in the Tower of London and the queen and her family get to use them. Uh, that's it. Our crown jewels at the University of California are, are made to be used for the betterment of all, not just one family. Scientists from around the world come and stay and study within these reserves so that all of the world uh, benefits from, from these crown jewels. And um, I'm going to let Violet and Al talk about their role in pr protecting these crown jewels, but it, it's just a, a great honor for me to be here tonight and, and be part of this, uh, this kind of sharing of the, the, the special nature of the reserve system at the University of California. Back to you, Leslie. And, th and thank you so much. I'm going to introduce our two next two speakers together. First, we're going to hear from Violet Nakayama. Violet started her career at the University of California as an attorney in the office of the general counsel, where one of her assignments was to be counsel to the natural reserve system. I think they loved her so much that they poached her. And that's my opinion. I don't know whether it's verified or not. Um, and she became the policy and legal coordinator for the university's natural reserve system, where she worked until her retirement just a few years ago. Violet will tell you about how, um, how she was helpful in negotiating many of the reserves that we see with federal, state, and private landowners and talk a little bit about the cooperative relationships that we have with various entities. After Violet uh, takes us on this whirlwind tour through our various reserves, the pictures are gorgeous, by the way, 
Uh, Al will then take us into a deep dive into, Bo into Boyd. Al received his BA and MA in biology from the California State University Fullerton and a PhD in zoology from the University of Wisconsin. Not within a couple of years after his PhD, he was uh, hired by the natural reserve system and came to Boyd as its director where he remained for 35 years until his retirement a short time ago. Uh, as we shall learn tonight, Al is also herpetologist with research interests in lizards in the, is that, am I saying it right, Aeolian sand ecosystems? And we'll learn about that research. Then who better than Al to take us to Boyd and then to Namib? Al, uh, Violet, you first. Okay, all right, what I'm going to do is share the screen, Leslie, hang on, whoops, okay, Nancy, let's Nancy. see. Nancy, who's going to let you share the screen? Host, is it part of? Okay. Nancy, could you let me share screen? It uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, shall we try one more time? Um, I, Nancy, are you controlling there, the presentation? You. Nancy, are you going to enable street screen sharing, please? We're, we're about to go into hand puppet mode. <laughs> we should be able to do it. Uh, let's try again. There we go. Oh, wait. Uh, here we go. This is it. Let's see. Very good. Can you see that now, everyone? Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Oh, but I want to, there we go. And what I want to do is just reduce it. There we go. Okay. I don't know what that line is, but I'll just ignore it. So thank you, Leslie. Hello. Welcome to the University of California's Natural Reserve System, referred to as the NRS from here on. It is the largest university administered reserve system in the world. Interestingly, five reserves have been designated as part of the United Nations Man of the Biosphere program, which includes Boyd Deep Canyon, Al's Reserve. The, the mission of the NRS is to contribute to the understanding and wise stewardship of the earth and its natural systems by supporting university level teaching, research and public service at protected areas throughout California. <coughs> 41 reserves assigned to nine UC campuses for day-to-day -day management as shown on this map cover roughly 756,000 acres. The university does not, however, own all of these lands. Much of these lands have been designated an NRS site through long-term use agreements with various entities and landowners. All but nine reserves offer various facilities and infrastructure for lodging, classrooms, and laboratories. The NRS was established in 1965 with six original reserves through the efforts of three faculty at UCLA and UCR who were alarmed to see many of their long-term research sites destroyed by development. Here were two field sites in the desert in 1955. Fast forward to 2015, can you see that? Uh, it depicts one of the sites now <clears throat> surrounded by development. And here's the second site. Mm -hmm. The reason UC has so many reserves is because California is extremely diverse with a geology and climate more varied than in any other state. The NRS includes examples of every major habitat type native to California, such as salt marshes, alpine peaks, arid deserts, oak woodlands, redwood forests, grasslands, coastal tide pools, and even volcanoes. It truly is a library of California ecosystems. Let's begin with examples of different ecosystems while I try to highlight several enduring partnerships that sustain the system. Yosemite Field Station, one of four alpine reserves, is located in the historic village of Wawona, and is administered through an agreement with the National Park Service. One of the 11 chaparral reserves is Hastings Natural History Reservation in Carmel Valley, 
which was donated by the Hastings family and established in 1939 and managed for many years by UC Berkeley. Año Nuevo Island Reserve, located near Santa Cruz, is owned by California State Parks, but has been collaboratively managed under a decades-long agreement. Stunt Ranch Santa Monica Mountains Reserve, north of Los Angeles, is one of three oak woodland reserves and is one of the seven reserves that burned this past summer. Seichen Creek Field Station of the Sierras is one of four conifer forest reserves. It's owned by the National Forest Service and has been managed by the university since 1951 under an agreement. Here's Al's Boyd Deep Canyon Desert Research Center, one of four desert reserves. Jepson Prairie Reserve, one of two grassland reserves in the Central Valley, has been cooperatively managed with the Solano Land Trust for many years through an agreement. San Joaquin Marsh Reserve, located in an ancient river cut channel at the head of Newport Bay and adjacent to the Irvine campus, is one of three marsh reserves. Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Laboratory, just south of Mammoth Lakes, and one of two sagebrush reserves serves as a major center for research for the Eastern Sierra Nevada and Owens Valley. This land is owned and leased by the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. The reason it's called aquatic is because Convict Creek runs through it. The stream was diverted to create an experimental stream system with nine meandering channels having the same stream regime. Finally, last year, in partnership with Lassen National Park, the Lassen Field Station was created to fill the volcanic ecosystem gap. So hopefully we've covered all major ecosystems in California now. Lassen Peak, the world's largest plug volcano, is the southernmost volcano in the Cascade Range. The reserve seeds with bubbling mud pots, steaming sulfur vents, and boiling hot springs, plus three more types of volcanoes. Reserves offer outdoor classrooms to not only UC students, but to students from all over the country and the world. Reserves are also a gateway to more than 1 million acres of neighboring public lands. In addition to facilities and other services, reserves can also provide logistical support such as this. Reserve use is not limited to UC students, teachers, and researchers. The sites are open to all qualified users in science, art, humanities, teaching, and other disciplines. A major portion of users are researchers who study such topics as the prevalence of Lyme disease among California ticks and the effects of drought and climate change on native plants and wildlife. Some participate in several national research projects that examine basic processes governing the workings of the environment. Those studies inform conservation and enable Californians to live side by side with the wild plants and animals that produce our oxygen, clean our water, pollinate our food, and make California such a coveted place to live. Research out of Año Nuevo Island Reserve revealed the complex diving patterns and paths of northern elephant seals as they fan out thousands of miles into the Pacific Ocean. UC Berkeley researchers are part of climate research at NRS sites across California, applying recent discoveries in atmospheric chemistry to answer the question of how coast redwoods will fare in a future California that is hotter, drier, and likely to experience less coastal fog. Several reserves are looking for new ways to manage forests. The August wildfires incinerated tens of thousands of acres across seven reserves. This fall, the NRS will deploy rapid re response teams to study the extent and intensity of the burns, 
and to monitor the effects of wildfire on a wide range of California ecosystems. They'll fly drones across hazards such as ravines, cliffs, thick brush, and poison oak to obtain more comprehensive surveys of extremely rugged areas charred by fire. The NRS span a north to south distance of 500 miles and an east to west distance of 470 miles. This vast reach, reach of the system enables researchers to compare species and conditions in one portion of the state with those of another at a spatial magnitude relevant to entire ecosystems. For this reason, a number of major research projects involve transects featuring multiple NRS reserves. A climate monitoring network connects the reserves. The NRS's California Heartbeat Initiative deploys a combination of ground sensors and aerial imagery to monitor the effects of climate change on California's ecosystems. Over 2,100 species of native plants, or 30% of California's native plant species, are found on NRS reserves. Numerous reserves host thousands of K-12 children annually in environmental education programs. Reserves provide habitat refuge for numerous species at risk. For example, 15 of California's 24 imperiled amphibian species occur on the reserves. Many reserves can offer various scientific expertise to neighboring communities and the state. Here's the, uh, I forgot this, this is how they provide uh, uh, expertise. And then finally, with the exception of few reserves, most are closed to the public to protect research sites and sensitive habitats. However, a number of reserves offer public events in the form of a lecture series or an open house. At a staff meeting in 2013, I mused how nice it would have been to have a sister reserve program, particularly since I had assisted Al in his lizard research in Namibia on five occasions. From that evolved a sister reserve agreement with Gobabeb Namib Research Institute in Namibia. In 2019, Eco Alianza de Loreto, located in Baja California Sur, and managed by a nonprofit conservation organization became the second sister reserve. I hope that you've enjoyed this brief introduction to the UCNRS. Now I'll turn this over to Al. Well, greetings all. So this afternoon, I'll follow up on Chancellor Wilcox and Violet's introduction to the natural reserve system. I'll start by giving a brief overview of the Philip L. Boyd Deep Canyon Desert Research Center, and then transition into our research on lizards. I'm trying to distill three one hour talks down to 30 minutes. So bear with me if I gloss over things and make some head scratching transitions. I've already screwed it up. There we go. The Philip L. Boyd Deep Canyon Desert Research Center is an awfully long name for a reserve. In all my years, I failed to come up with a suitable acronym for the reserve. This just simply does not work. So <laughs> for the rest of the talk, I'll just refer to it as Deep Canyon or the reserve. As noted by Violet, Deep Canyon is one of 41 reserves that comprise the UC NRS. The reserve is located on the southern side of the Coachella Valley in the Colorado subdivision of the Sonoran Desert. Mojave Desert is all of this stuff up here. Deep Canyon is located south of the city of Palm Desert it's about 10 miles east of Palm Springs. 
The reserve is comprised of about 6,500 acres of UC owned land and another 10,000 acres of public land under use agreements with the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service. And to top it all off, the reserve is embedded within the Santa Rosa San Jacinto National Monument. In addition to research that occurs here at Deep Canyon, the reserve is a gateway that provides access to protected natural areas within an hour's drive of Deep Canyon. We have Joshua Tree National Park, essentially all of this up here, Anza Borrego State Park, arguably the largest state park in the United States, San to Snow National Monument, off in that direction, San Jacinto State Park and Wilderness Area over there. And, oops, it's over there. You can't see it when it goes off the screen, can you? Okay, so the new UC campus opened in Riverside in 1954. Shortly after the campus was established, researchers began working at the Palm Springs Desert Museum Wildlife Sanctuary in Palm Desert. However, it soon became apparent that with nature trails open to the public and without protection, long-term research were incompatible with public use. In 1956, scientists from UCR and Caltech approached the owner of the land to the south of the sanctuary for permission to establish projects in what was then a remote area and seemed secure from public interference. In 1956, that area was at the end of the world here at the mouth of Deep Canyon. Much to our good fortune, the land was owned by a very generous and far-sighted man, Philip Boyd. In short order, the scientists and Mr. Boyd reached the consensus on the significance of Deep Canyon as an outdoor natural science laboratory. In December 1958, Mr. Boyd donated 1,700 acres and provided funds to purchase an additional 1,900 acres that formed the core of today's research center. Deep Canyon actually preceded the creation of the natural reserve system and was one of the original reserves incorporated into the system. Mr. Boyd was later appointed to the Board of Regents of the UC by then Governor Ronald Reagan, who went on to do other things afterwards. Uh, Mr. Boyd's active interest and support for the University of California and Deep Canyon continued until his death in 1989. As scientists and citizens, we should all commend Mr. Boyd for his farsightedness and generosity that provided us with a research facility that is recognized internationally and attracts scientists from all over the world. Initial construction of facilities began in 1961 with the construction of a small bunkhouse and tool room cistern that still exist to this day. Things have changed a bit. Today, the user facilities consist of a of researcher residents, a collections room, two laboratories, office space, bighorn sheep holding pen, a campground for teaching use to the north, a small research facility at Agave Hill with about the 2,500 foot elevation. Staff facilities consist of a staff office building, a workshop, tool storage and, and use area, as well as the director's residence. This is my front yard for 35 years. And I can assure you that one or two libations were held there on the, the front deck of the residence. <laughs> the latest addition to the facilities is the Tevis Family Education Center that's in the throes of the final punch list for completion. That occupies, if I can get back, nope, there we go. That occupies this footprint right here. 
The Mayhew residence was constructed in 1994. It provides long-term housing for up to 14 visiting scientists. Now, comfortable housing and labs to work in are nice, but that's not the primary reason why scientists come to Deep Canyon. Part of the reason that they come is because the reserve offers easy access to a diversity of habitats contained within a single watershed and convenient access to the other nearby protected natural areas that I mentioned. The habitats of Deep Canyon are related closely to the landforms and climatic changes that occur with increasing elevation. An inventory of the major habitats would include the following. Coniferous forests on the upper slopes of the Santa Rosas, that's Toro Peak hidden behind, which just came there, it is 8,700 feet. The plateau at the base of, of the mountains contains pinyon juniper habitat and gradually changes to more succulent desert adapted vaca vacation oh, vegetation as you encounter the rocky hillsides. The rocky hillsides uh, at first glance do appear to be rather barren, but if you, if you study them a bit, you'll find that there's over a hundred species of annual plants over 100 species of perennials that are found here on the slopes. As you move off of the rocky hillsides, you encounter the Deep Canyon alluvial plain. And last but not least is our eponymous namesake, Deep Canyon. The Deep Canyon Gorge runs in this direction and over here begins at the dividing line between the Santa Rosas and San Jacinto Mountains. It runs eastward, then turns to the northeast, and drains here onto the Deep Canyon alluvial plain. From the top of the Santa Rosas to the reserve boundary, there's an 8,000 foot elevation change over about 11 mile distance. The elevation change and the concomitant changes in environmental conditions create a diversity of habitats and in turn, the flora and fauna change to reflect the physical changes in the environment. Deep Canyon is a hotspot of biological diversity. And that rounds out our cast of habitats, habitats, which in and of themselves is a great attraction but that still doesn't explain why scientists come from all over the world. If you ask them, the answers are as varied as their research interests, but they all seem to revolve around the fact that Deep Canyon offers a place to study plants and animals in one of the most extreme temperature and aridity environments to be found anywhere. Life at the limits, presents the researcher with an opportunity to observe and study behavioral adaptations and physiological systems under stress. These conditions often reveal remarkable behavioral plasticity and physiological efficiencies that would not be expressed under less stressful conditions and indeed could not be predicted from results obtained in more nine environments. As I just mentioned, the Coachella Valley is one of the hottest and driest places on earth. It is not the hottest or the driest. But the climatic extremes that exist there create a challenging environment. The Coachella Valley fringe toad lizard is one of the denizens of the Coachella Valley. It is endemic to the valley and restricted to aeolian sand habitat. That's just another way of saying it's found no other place on earth and it obligate, it's obligatory that it exists in windblown sand habitat. The original geographic range of the lizard was about 200 square miles. But by 1980, development within its habitat had reduced the lizard's range to about 4% eight square miles 
of its historic range. In 1980, the lizard was listed as an endangered species by the US Fish and Wildlife Service and as a threatened species by the state of California. The state and federal listings stopped development in the Coachella Valley with significant economic consequences for the economy. The way out of that dilemma was a process that created a habitat conservation plan that provided for the existence of the lizard in perpetuity in habitat reserves and then permitted development activities to continue in other areas. It's a long and complicated story of how the Habitat Conservation Plan was crafted, but suffice it to say that Deep Canyon was perfectly positioned to participate in the process and provide the scientific basis for the fringe toad lizard habitat conservation plan as it was all done as part of the NRS mission of teaching, research, and public service. 15 years later, due in part to the success of the fringe toad plan, the Coachella Valley Association of Governments initiated work on a 1 million acre multiple species habitat conservation plan to cover 26 species of potentially listed, listable or listed animals. Once again, Deep Canyon was perfectly positioned to participate in the process in the core science advisory group for the plan. Today, the multiple species habitat conservation plan is a national standard for such plans. The Coachella Valley Fringe to Lizard Habitat Conservation Plan was adopted in 1985. Habitat loss was the basis for listing the lizard and creation of three reserves to assure long-term viable populations of the lizard. However, at that time, we really knew very little about the population biology, population biology of the lizard. The lizard does not occur at Deep Canyon, but it occurs very nearby. Again, the gateway reserve concept. In 1985, my research partner, Mark Fisher, and I initiated a monitoring study of the population biology of the lizard. We were basically interested in how do fringe toes make a living in a very inhospitable environment. We're interested in such things as the demography of the populations. How, do the, how does the ratio of males, females, juveniles change with environmental variables? How much territory, how much real estate does it take for a fringe to a lizard to make a living? How does that change with body size and the sex of the lizard? How does it change within and between years? and so forth and so on. So how do you approach those questions? It's not very sexy, it's actually pretty boring, but it's long-term mark and recapture studies. These are simple repetitive census methods that yield a surprising amount of data about population size, population variation, spatial relationships, habitat usage, and so on. The study that we started in 1985 is ongoing to this day. So after chasing lizards for a long time, what do we think we know about them? Our studies and those of others indicate that as a group, fringe toed lizards have exploited morphological adaptations. Those are bodily things that you can see. Adaptations to the aeolian environment, but physiologically and behaviorally, they are not a very distinct group from the basic iguanid lizard approach to life in the desert. There's a basic iguanid strategy for coping with deserts. However, superimposed on the general strategy, there are specializations that enable some species to exploit certain habitats to their fullest advantage. It is only when we look at the morphological adaptation of fringe toed lizards 
that we really find a suite of characters that distinguish fringe toes from other iguanids found in our deserts. These adaptations allow them to exploit the alien sand environment to its fullest potential. Alien sand, where the lizard occurs, is fine sand, it's windblown sand, that ranges from a tenth to one millimeter in diameter. They readily burrow into the sand and when pursued, they dive into the sand and disappear. Some of the more obvious morphological adaptations that enable fringe toes to move rapidly over, under, and through aeolian sand are, well, start with the eponymous fringes on their toes. There, and you can see them here. Well, how does that work? If you look at a drawing of their, of their feet, you can see that there are fringes, obviously, on the outside of the toes. These scales are hinged such that when the lizard moves its foot forward through the sand, the fringes bend back up against the toes. They reduce the surface area and allow the foot to move uh, with less friction through the sand. Now, when the lizard wants to move forward in a hurry, pushes back hard, these fringes that were hinged come out, vastly increase the surface area of the toes and the feet and allow the lizard to move forward efficiently over the sand without slipping. Essentially, it makes it's the difference uh, in that if your car tires are spinning, you put on a bigger tire, you get a better grip and you move forward. Other physical features include this chisel shaped head that enables them to penetrate easily into the sand. These round smooth scales that reduce friction as the lizard moves through the sand. Once you get yourself into the sand, then a whole series of other problems uh, emerge or submerge. Uh, <laughs> if you have ever done a face plant in sand or snow, you'll appreciate some of the solutions to the problems that, are, that you find in keeping sand out of important places. The jaw is countersunk. That's to say the lower jaw fits up into a groove inside this upper wedge-shaped jaw. The nares, the nostrils, have valves that can open and close. If sand gets through the valves, they enter the respiratory passageways that actually begin with a U-shape that goes here. Now, if you go out into your kitchen or any under any sink you wanna look at, you'll find a pipe that comes down from the drain into a U-shaped trap. That keeps anything that gets in from moving into the rest of the plumbing. Same thing applies here with fringe toes. Small particles that get into the U-shaped trap are just simply sneezed out. The eyelids have a double uh, lid arrangement here and here. Sand that gets into the eyes is moved forward and flicked out here from the anterior corner. Lizards don't have ears like mammals do, but they have a, an opening called the external auditory meatus, if you're a geek. Otherwise, it's the ear hole. In fringe nose, there's a flap of uh, scale skin that covers that hole when the lizard emerges or submerges into the sand. So in 1997, after 13 years of working on fringe toed lizards, we were arrogant enough to think that we really knew something about how lizards make a living in sand dunes. After a while, it occurred to us, you know, there's really a lot of sand in the world. We began to wonder if other lizards living in sand habitats solve their ecological problems the same way as our lizard. 
The problem is not in finding lizards with similar morphological adaptations. In today's world, the problem is finding a safe place to work in this day and age. 20 to 30% of the world's surface is covered in desert. A lot of sand in the Sahara, North Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, but there's a little problem with Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan and in India over here, Mongolia over here, a lot of sand. Peeking around the corner here is Australia. But we decided to look down here in the other corner at a place called Namibia. The Namib Desert is really a serious desert. The desert begins down in Orangemon, just off the uh, image here, runs for about 500 miles all the way up to Walvis Bay here. From Ludritz to Walvis Bay, it's about 250 miles. There are continuous sand dunes that begin on the coast and run 30 to 60 miles inland. Like the Anacama Desert in Peru, the Namib Desert is a fog desert. The cold Benguela current takes an express lane from the Antarctic, moves up past this part of, the, part of Africa. Westerly winds bring moisture laden air. They encounter the cold Namib current the moisture precipitates out in the form of fog. By the time those air masses hit the coast, <coughs> excuse me, it's very dry air. As a matter of fact, the Namib Desert gets more precipitation input on a yearly basis from fog than it does from rain. It is also because of this maritime influence that the Namib Desert is not a very hot desert. 90 degrees, you know, right around there, is about as warm as it ever gets. It is essentially an aseasonal desert. Now, all of that finally sets the stage for the introduction of our second superhero, Maroli Zanchidi. Well, this is a big male. <laughs> They weigh about an ounce. They are less than two inches from the snout to the groin area of the vent. And for comparison with our fringe toed lizards, a hatchling fringe, fringe toe is about the size of an adult Maroli's. This is a remarkable little beast. It is well adapted for living on and in Aeolian sand. And once again, note the granular scales, they're really very velvety. Chisel snake, shout, shout, snout, an underslung jaw. And right back here, lo and behold, fringes. Now we've seen all of that before. Fringed toes have evolved 26 times independently in seven of the 14 families of lizards. There are at least 150 species of lizards with fancy toes. <laughs> Many of the species of lizards that live in sand systems have come to look alike with their fringe toes, the chiseled snouts, smooth scales, etc. These are good examples of a thing called convergent evolution, wherein distantly related species independently evolve similar traits as adaptations to similar environments or ecological niches. In 1997, we initiated our project in Namibia at Gobabeb Namib Research Institute. Since the initial trip, we've returned eight times. Gobabeb is conveniently located uh, on the dry Kwisab River, which runs behind the station it's at the northern extreme of the sand sea and the southern extreme of the gravel plains. This image is a bit deceiving because of all this dry grass out here and over there 
on a normal year, there's nothing here. There's about as much vegetation as you find in a Walmart parking lot. <laughs> Add about an inch of rain uh, during the wet season uh, that preceded this image. And I'll spare you all the question, this structure is a water tower. It is not an alien spaceship and there are not alien bases in the Namib Desert. <laughs> Our research at Gobabeb eventually led to a cooperative research agreement between Deep Canyon and Gobabeb and ultimately to Gobabeb as being a sister reserve for the natural reserve system. The Namib Desert Dunes make the Coachella Valley look lush. As I said, this is a serious desert. Our study site was about 15 minutes by four wheel drive from the station. Uh, this is Helga's Dune, or more precisely, it should be Helga's Dune Complex. This is a 100 meter dune, 300 feet from the base to the top of the dune. The lizards are found anywhere on these sand masses, and they seldom get more than a couple of meters out here onto the gravel plains. Preferentially, the lizards are found here on these slip faces. If you think you're in good shape, I suggest you try chasing a lizard up a slip face, keeping an eye on where he submerges into the sand while the slip face tries to bury you as you try to run up it. And I can assure you, the lizards have a much easier time of it than you do. So what has all the travel, time, and research taught us? Well, to begin with, a great deal of humility. <laughs> we thought that since the lizards both lived in aeolian sand environments, and that they had many of the same morphological adaptations, then they would make a living in similar ways. Well, turns out they don't. Mo their modes of reproduction, demography, behavior, etc., are different, but it works, works very well for them in the places that they live. Another lesson that we learned is the value of long-term yield studies. One of the fundamental questions that is always asked is how many animals are there anyway? Well, this is a simple bar graph showing five years of our work, population estimate, how many lizards are there on this axis and just the years uh, that we, we were there for the research. The bars are very simply the number of males and female and juvenile lizards that we estimate are in the population. So you show this to the biologists, they're gonna look at it and say, well, what do we glean from all of this? To begin with, there's a relatively constant small population of animals on the study site. There's a relatively constant number or relatively equal number of males and females in the population. There are few juvenile animals, which from that we can infer that the adults are probably long lived. They have a low rate of reproduction and the recruitment of juveniles into the adult age classes uh, is relatively small. Well, that all makes sense. And it's pretty much what you'd expect. Well, then there was 2001. <laughs> if I had a time machine, I'd go back to 2000 and see what the precursors were for this swarm of animals that appeared in 2001. We can't explain this. We had the same weather. We had the same number of people, the same amount of time in the field. There were just a whole bunch of lizards. We can't tell you what happened to all these juveniles. Clearly they were not recruited into the adult population. 
and what happened to these so-called long-lived adults, we just don't know. The take-home lesson from this is that these short, one-time snapshots in time are unreliable. This is a good example of why you should always question the results of short-term field studies. And if we had only gone in 2001, we would have had a very different picture of the population structure of the lizard. So there's an awful lot that we don't know about these little guys. And that's one of the reason that we keep going back. There's a lot of science to do. It's intellectually satisfying. And we have to admit it's fun. And somebody's got to do it, you know? I hope this presentation gives you some appreciation of these remarkable animals in the harsh environments where they make a living. I'd be remiss not to acknowledge Mark Fisher as my co-principal investigator on both lizard research projects over the last 35 years. I would be even more remiss and I'm certain regretful for not acknowledging a great deal of thanks to my very tolerant and long suffering wife Violet Nakayama. So I hope you've enjoyed this presentation, but there are a few more thoughts that I'd like to leave you with. Field stations are environmental sentinels on climate change. Protected natural areas and field stations are essential to understanding our world and how it works. Field stations enable long-term studies and they are the repository of biological and environmental information that enables us to objectively observe and validate long-term trends in the environment. Deep Canyon has a meteorological database that spans 60 years and biological surveys that span a similar period of time. Climate change is real and its effect on our weather and the distribution of plants and animals in Deep Canyon have been documented in peer-reviewed journal publications. The shifting baseline of which each generation considers to be normal, the weather, plant and animal distributions, they're deceiving. But long-term data from field stations in protected natural areas enables us to see the past and anticipate the future. Thank you. Okay, stop screen sharing. And there we there are. It's all yours, Leslie. Thank you very much, Al and Violet. That was really quite a wonderful trip. Um, we have a number of questions that are coming in um, from on the chat room. And Nancy, will you handle those questions? Okay. Um, should I do mine first? No, <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. Um, let's see, what do we have here? Um, uh, our, uh, le from Joe Whitehouse, lessons from lizards, key adaptations for other species as we move into a hotter and drier planet. Uh, Joe, would you like to um, expand on that thought just a little bit to understand it better? Joe? First, uh, Al and Violet, thank you very much. It reminded me of my older brother who fell in love with lizards as an undergraduate, but in the end became a physician. So you lost a colleague who would have been quite interesting. Where did he go wrong? <laughs> it was the um, water. <laughs> I think it was the temperatures at which you guys go chase the lizards. Um, in any event, you know, there's something that I don't understand about the ecosystem of these lizards. Um, what are they eating? What are the what are their predators? What are their 
what do they prey on? And it doesn't look like there's too much growth. So help me understand that ecosystem. And again, is this going to be come the ecosystem of planet Earth? Um, let's start with how they make a living, what they eat. Um, the most of the lizards that live in those systems eat bugs or insectivores. Uh, if you're in the Coachella Valley, it has more plants, it's more lush. There's a great diversity of insects that occur there um, year round. Uh, and when all else fails, the fringe toes, they'll eat ants. Ants are full of formic acid. That's a tough thing to do, but they do it. They get along just fine. In the Namib Desert, that is the center of uh, Tenebrionid beetle diversity. There are hundreds of species of this kind of beetle that are found there. The Maroles will eat the larvae and a few of the smaller beetles, but they also eat seeds. They're the only lizard that we know that eats seeds. How do the seeds get there? Well, on those rare occasions when it rains, I showed you the brown grass. On a really wet year, those interdunal plains between the, uh, the gravel plains between the dunes, will look like hay fields out there. It dries up, it blows away, where does it go? It blows into the dunes. Most of the energy input into those dunes comes from the gravel plains. It's autochthonous. It occurs in that area. It, it has its origin in that area. There are also herbivorous lizards, lizards that eat plants that occur in those habitats as well. Uh, in the Namib, there are fewer uh, perennial plants um, but it doesn't take much to be a lizard. You don't need as much as it, it takes about one tenth the energy to support a lizard as it does a mammal. I'm sure the physiologists among us will wonder about that or question it. But uh, that's one of the reasons they do so well in deserts. Is this the future of the earth? No. The deserts will expand, they will move and other habitats will move uh, north or south or up mountains. There's only so far some habitats and, and species can move up a mountain, but the, the world won't all become deserts. If it did, boy, we'd, be, we'd, we'd have good job uh, security, wouldn't we? Another question from Susan Pierpoint. Looks like grandchildren. Um, they, Ainsley and Merritt, want to know how you catch the lizards. <laughs> There's um, the Maroles that live on those steep slip faces. You have to chase them till they go under in the sand and then keep an eye on where they go down and one hand under, one hand over, sort of like this and bring it together. Uh, they're just too spooky to use our normal method, which is called noosing. It's simply, most times, uh, a fiberglass fishing pole with a little noose on the end of many different kinds of material. And you just carefully put that noose over the lizard's head and give it a little yank, noose closes, and you pick the lizard up. It's approved by all the uh, regulatory agencies and everybody else, doesn't hurt the lizard. That's the easiest way. If you Actually, it's a safer way for the animal. If you try to grab them by hand, you frequently injure them, break their tails, uh, or whatever. So noosing, or if you can't do that, dig them out of the sand is how you catch those two lizards. 
Okay. Um, what functions, Judy Webster asks, do these lizards serve? Why are why do we have lizards? Well, why do we have us? You know, we're we're just part of the ecosystem. The, the lizards are part of an intricate oh, what's the an intricate an intricate play of life. They all do something to keep the system functioning and coherent. And it, you know, the, the old analogy is if you're in an airplane, it's held together by rivets. Rivets are species. The airplane is the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And you're going along at 40,000 feet and you start randomly popping rivets out of the fuselage of the plane, sooner or later, that plane is going to come down. Yeah. Same analogy applies to ecosystems. The diversity of things in the system keep it functioning and running smoothly. You start eliminating things, and the system is going to change eventually. At what point it changes, it's hard to say. Yeah. You know, if, if you look at things called apex predators, you remove a starfish from a tide pool or a wolf from Yellowstone, the whole thing changes. Yeah. So that's what, you know, the lizard part that the lizards play in the ecosystem, they eat a bunch of bugs. Well, if they were gone, you'd be overrun with bugs. <laughs> Who preys on the lizards? Just about anything that can get a lizard in its mouth. Um, they have a whole host of predators from other lizards, snakes, mammals, birds. Um, actually, food webs in these desert systems are extraordinarily complex. You have large invertebrates like scorpions, tarantulas, millipedes, those things will all eat small lizards. Lizards grow up, what do they eat? Tarantulas, scorpions, <laughs> millipedes. So a lot of things eat lizards when they're small. As the lizards grow up, they eat some of the things that eat them. Um, basically, you know, everything eats everything else out there. Are we and losing, if you want to carry it to an extreme, so do the plants when they die. Are we losing a lot of the species of lizards? Are they disappearing? Some are. Um, but overall, the problem is habitat loss. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not over collecting or much else, but habitat conversion into you know, agriculture, those sorts of things. Uh, what's in a lot more trouble in the subject of herpeto herpetologists also is amphibians. Uh, habitat loss and uh, a worldwide pandemic of chytrid fungus that makes our current situation look benign. Uh, Many, many, I'll say hundreds of species of frogs are in trouble or have disappeared worldwide. Um, so the amphibians are in far more trouble uh, than, than the herps, than, than the uh, lizards and snakes. Another interesting question. Are there any effects um, in the Coachella Valley of agricultural pesticides? on these lizards? Um, there probably are, but most of the agricultural uh, development in the valley uh, took place, you know, in the 1920s, 1930s. Um, and most of, I hope my grower friends will forgive me, most of the damage done 
was done before pesticides and herbicides came into widespread use. Um, there have been some studies that show a pesticide burden, if you will, uh, pesticides in the bodies of some of the lizards. Uh, one concern that hasn't been fully resolved yet is there's a group of lizards called horned lizards. All they eat is ants. And the ants have been impacted by the pesticides that are sprayed on the fields. Uh, so there is some concern about the impact on ants, the diet that horned lizards eat. Um, it's, it's, it's a good question and one that I really think should be looked into. So uh, Beatrice um, Konecki makes a comment. She says she has two geckos and if they are picked up um, with, without them knowing that they're being picked up, like if they're scared, um, um, they may drop their tail. Yeah, they do in defense because in the wild, if they get picked up, usually birds pick them up by their talons, they will wiggle until the bird is only holding their tail and then they will drop their tail so they can fall down and they will be safe and the tail, but it'll just be a bit more bone. Well, Beatrice, uh, a lot of lizards will lose their tail with a little bit of pressure or even without pressure, they can autonomize, break, break the tail and leave it flopping around uh, while they go off to, you know, eat some more bugs, live another day. Uh, the tail will grow back. It grows back um, slightly different than the original tail. When the tail is lost, there's very little bleeding. It's not like you cutting off a hand or an arm. Uh, there are special, if you will, slip joints in the muscles of a lizard tail that come apart like that. And there are valves in the blood vessels that close it off. There's very little bleeding. And one of the things that we really don't know is how, in fact, lizards can grow back a tail that sends safe, the nerves are, new nerves are formed and grow there. The muscles are still innervated and work well. The lizard has complete control over it. We don't know how to grow back human limbs. Amphibians, some of them, can go even better. You cut off a, a leg, arm, they'll grow it back. How do they do that? These are the so-called lower vertebrates. They've got an awful lot to teach us. Very good, very good. I want to combine these. What is the lifespan of the lizards and how many are in the world? <laughs> uh, there's a bunch of lizards. Um, Undoubtedly, there are more of them than there are of us. They're small, their numbers are far greater than, shall I say we're charismatic megafauna. So the small things always outnumber the big things. Um, what was the second half of the question? Um, oh, lifespan. Oh, lifespan. It depends on the lizard. Hmm. There are some lizards generally small, that live less than a year. They're in that in one particular bunch, the juveniles hatch out of an egg, but all the adults are gone. And that's how quick that population turns over. Um, another group of common lizards in, in the US, side watch lizards, uh, they, most of them live a year. Occasionally, some will live two, uh, but they tend to be almost an annual lizard. Other lizards have long lifespans. Uh, there are some lizards that live on San Clemente Island 
that a friend of mine is Bill Mouts has been studying well, for 40 years now. And he has marked animals. He goes back, turns over the same board year after year after, and those darn animals are still there. They don't move. They live under that board. And, you know, they have long lifespans. Uh, so it's hard to say how long the animals live. There's, there are exceptions. In general, the bigger the animal, the longer it'll live. So are there many species of lizards on these dunes, or is this the only one that is specifically able to survive here? Again, it depends on the dune system. Um, in the Coachella Valley, there are three or four other common uh, species. In the Namib, that's a lot more harsh, serious. There's a couple of other species of lizards that sort of occur on the dunes, but they don't occur on the slip faces. They'll be down at the base of the dunes and the little patches of vegetation that occur there. They're related, same genus, Maroles, uh, but they don't get up into the sand. And as soon as you get off of the, the sand, out onto the gravel plains, there's a gecko called the barking gecko that occurs there. And believe me, they, they make a racket. They can keep you awake at night when they're really, really tuned up. So I was in the Namib um, the summer of 2018 and I have a picture of a lizard on the slip face of the dune. I would look at it and see if it has an undercut jaw. <laughs> if it's one of those dunes like I showed you, I'll bet you it does. What was the name of that lizard? It's a sand diving lizard, Maroles and Chidi is the scientific name. Thank you. Let's see. You, you can Google it and it comes right up. Now, there was a question about how the deep canyon was formed. Um, and the thought uh, by Linda Millard was it looks like a fault line. Can you help with that? Sorry, would you repeat the first part of the question? How was the deep canyon formed? Was it, was it, a, was it earthquake? Was it a fault line? It's that whole portion of Southern California is just riddled with faults. 10 miles from the station is the San Andreas Fault. Mm -hmm. When that goes for the eight pointer, Deep Canyon will be one of the first to know. And by the way, we have a seismograph there too. Mm -hmm. um, the Santa Rosas, the mountain range behind Deep Canyon, uh, is squeezed between uh, the San Andreas Fault and I'm blanking on the Hemet Fault on the other side. And so mm -hmm. as the as, as the valley, the Coachella Valley drops, the mountains have been pushed up. The, the German name for all this is called a Graben and a Horst. You get up on a Horst and you Graben down for something. Okay. Um, so the Santa Rosas that are there today are actually were the base of a very old mountain chain that preceded the Santa Rosas. So those have been popped up, you know, over the last few hundred million years, roughly. Then once you have a situation where you have sort of the base of the mountain going down in elevation, that sets up a really nice situation where you get erosion it keeps cutting things down deeper and deeper and deeper. So as the Santa Rosas go up, Deep Canyon form on its own fault, and it's the major drainage off of there. One, one last question also from Linda Millard. Um, can we join an expedition to Namibia? <laughs> 
Would you like to fund yeah. it? Yeah, Else you are. Retired. If you fund it, I will take you. <laughs> take you sitting right next to you on my computer shop. She's in the pink, pink blouse, Linda Millard. <laughs> Did I miss any? Oh, are the lizards poisonous? From number no. 786333. <laughs> no, uh, the only poisonous, venomous, you, 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 uh, you ingest the poison and you're envenomated uh, by a toxin. The only venomous lizards in the world are uh, the beaded lizards and the Gila monster. And you should, you should, you should leave those guys alone. <laughs> they will bite. Uh, it's not going to kill you, but it's not a pleasant experience. And we're not going to. So I'm told. We're not going to misinterpret this lizard from the Gila monster. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> Gila monsters are very, very different looking. Okay, yeah, so Anne Roth has a question for her grandson. Our, um wants to know about the danger of lizards and plants becoming extinct. Some uh, plants and animals are in danger of extinction. Uh, every year we discover more and more species. And unfortunately, a lot of those tend to be in places that are being changed by the day. Mm -hmm. uh, I, the consensus in, in uh, people that study species and speciation is that you know we're, we're losing species every day that we haven't even discovered yet. Mm -hmm. There are things out there that show up every year. They're new to science. Uh, they, there will always be plants and animals. Some of them are not going to be things that you're enamored with. Uh, cockroaches, crabgrass, uh, tardigrades, water bears, rats. They're going to inherit the earth. And they, 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 they've survived the dinosaurs, the, the last extinction events, and they're probably going to outlive us. Anybody? Don't have nightmares tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the wine's for. <laughs> so uh, does anyone else have a question? Have I missed any? I've been trying to trying to do it. Any 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 other burning issues that we have? I have a, probably half of the comments in the chat box are congratulating both of you on your presentation and how interesting it's been and how, how knowledgeable you are. I mean, obviously this is your life's profession, your life's business, but it's it's very impressive. And um, I'm, I'm glad that we had this opportunity. Well, thank you. We're good at fooling people. <laughs> I, I do want to thank Alan Violet. I had hoped to give them a a task that wasn't a lot of work, but as you can tell, they put a lot of work into this. And phenomenal for you all who have held on. It's now 621, and I still think more than half of the original crowd is mm. still here. So we really owe you a very big arcs thank you. And uh, we've all learned so much tonight. And you know, kudos to you all. And, Great uh, well, th thanks for the opportunity to talk about lizards. <laughs> it's a captive audience, you know. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Got a career, new career. Al before, Al, before you go, how would I be able to reach you in Violet? Oh, you can get them through me. Yeah, go, go through Leslie. She's got all the contact information. Yes. Oh my God, she's not going to let me reach you then. She's going to ask. Oh, she will. I may never talk to you again. <laughs> she will, I promise. Thank I you. Promise. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, -bye. bye everybody. <laughs> Thanks. Ah!
thank you very much. It was absolutely fascinating. Learned so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. You're welcome. I'm making a copy of the chat box here. I'm not going to hang up until I get that done. Again, thank you. <laughs> Leslie and Nancy, you handled that beautifully. Not an easy subject. And I learned a tremendous amount. Wonderful evening. Thank you. Great. That's great. You're on next, Eve. You're up next. Well, <laughs> I don't know how we could top this one. I will. We certainly can't. We learn from everything. Thank you. That was fun. Okay. Have a good day. You too. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.